Dear friends in Jesus Christ, before I get into the text here for today, we're partway into Mark chapter 7, I want to talk about the beginning of the chapter. So let me summarize it briefly. The people who are present there, we have the Pharisees and the scribes, and we have Jesus and his disciples. And keep in mind that the Pharisees and scribes, they were very strict about a man-made law about washing your hands before you eat. What about Jesus and his disciples? Well, sometimes they washed their hands before they ate, sometimes they didn't. Well, the Pharisees and scribes happened to see Jesus' disciples eating with unwashed hands, and they said to Jesus, why do your disciples eat with unwashed hands? Well, what did Jesus do? He quoted from the book of Isaiah. This is the quote. He said to them, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. In other words, he said to them, What you men say sounds honoring to God, but I can see into your hearts and I know that you are rejecting me as the Messiah. That's in a sense what Jesus was saying to them. So I want you to understand that was going on early there in the chapter. This is what I'm trying to emphasize especially. The topic was eating with unwashed hands. Keep that in mind. As we come to the text now, we're picking up in verse 14 of chapter 7, and Jesus is going to instruct the people about things that they eat and also about what comes out of the heart. So going to the first part here, we have kind of a summary of, of in and out. The Bible says, after Jesus called the crowd to him again. So keep in mind here, you had some of the religious leaders were there. They have left now. They heard what happened between them and Jesus. Now Jesus calls the crowd to them and says, hey, I want to explain to you guys to make sure you guys get it. After Jesus called the crowd to him again, he began saying to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside the man which can make him morally unclean if it goes into him. For example, if you eat with dirty hands, that is not going to make you morally unclean. That's what he was saying. But then Jesus went on, but the things which proceed out of the man, in other words, out of the mouth, those are the things that defile him. Those are the things that make him morally unclean. And then Jesus said, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. So just real quick here, uh, what did the Pharisees and scribes emphasize? They emphasized physical things like eating with washed hands. What about Jesus? What did he emphasize? Well, he emphasized spiritual things. In other words, things that are in the heart and things that come out of the mouth. So they're talking about very different things. And then Jesus said, if anyone has ears, let him hear. Well, as I look around, I think we all have two ears. So it's not an unusual thing. But what is Jesus really saying, if you have ears? He's saying, let's make sure that with them we are hearing. And upon hearing, we are thinking about what we heard because we want to understand it. And then if it is from the Bible, we want to make sure that we are believing that it is true. And then it's important that we make application in our lives. Those are such critical things. Coming to the second part here now, so we come to the mouth-stomach relationship. We're picking up in the text in verse 17. When Jesus had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. Jesus said to them, Are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him? because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach, and is eliminated, cleansing all the foods. Right at this point here with verse 19, 
it's quite a point of contention probably with people around the world. So I'm going to give you some things I think are important for you to know about what I just read. Now we're going to take our whole Bible class today. And we're going to look at some things in a careful way that I really want you to know about, but it's not the place right here to go into it. So some things I want you to know here, some important points on chapter 7, verse 19. First of all, there is a mistranslation of the Greek, and it pops up in almost every English version, not in every one, but almost in every one of them. In most versions, it says, into his stomach and is eliminated. And then we have this statement in there, thus he declared all foods clean. That is not what the Bible is saying in the Greek text. This is really the proper translation. Into his stomach and is eliminated, cleansing all foods. In other words, the implication, cleansing all foods from the body. What's going on here is because of the mistranslation, so many people are looking at it and they're thinking that Jesus somehow abolished the Old Testament food laws. That cannot be correct, and I'm going to show you why for a whole bunch of reasons. I'll give you a couple more now, but I hope you join us in Bible class. First of all, number three, as I already said, Jesus did not abolish the Old Testament food laws. Uh, Jesus came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it, so if we decide that he abolished it, that is going completely contrary to what Jesus said that he came to fulfill rather than abolish. And then I wanted to let you know that we have so much more in Bible class. Well, because I've mentioned the Old Testament food laws, let me just touch on those real quick. Understand that they're written out very extensively in two chapters in the Old Testament. What is the idea of the Old Testament food laws? First of all, they kept Israel separate from other nations. So imagine if they're going to have a hog roast in the neighboring nation, the Israelites aren't going to go. What's the danger in going? Well, a danger in going is you're going to hear what they have to say. You're going to find out what they believe. And God was concerned that the Israelites would get pulled into this false belief. So God said, don't eat all the different foods. I want to keep you separate from some. And then I'll share with you in Bible class today some of the dangers of eating particular foods if they're not prepared in a very careful way. And they didn't know about that back then. So God said, don't eat those foods because they can make you sick. Again, we'll get into that a little bit more. And then understand too that the Old Testament food laws they were still in place at the time of Jesus, and it wasn't until he had fulfilled the law by living a perfect life and then taking our sins, taking our punishment, and opening the way to heaven on Good Friday. So up until then, those food laws were in place. What about today? Well, are there New Testament food restrictions? The answer is no. Think about Peter's vision there in Acts 10 where he has that sheet let down in front of him. There's all manner of animals on the sheet, including animals that are forbidden in the Old Testament. And what is Peter told three times? He is told to kill and eat. Peter initially is saying, no way, I'm not going to do that. I've never eaten any of those forbidden animals. But God convinces him about that. And what's that really telling us? I believe it's telling us that the food restrictions have ended that's part of what God wants Peter to know. But the more important thing he wants Peter to know is that the separation between Jews and Gentiles has come to an end. Because right after the vision, what happens there in Acts chapter 10? So Peter gets the knock at the door. Who's at the door? There are messengers who have come from Cornelius. Cornelius the Gentile, he has had a vision. And in the vision, he was told to send for Peter, to Peter to come to his house and to tell him about Jesus. 
Well, because of the separation, Peter could not even go into the home of a Gentile. So God was communicating to Peter that it's okay now. The separation is over. It's okay to go into the home. So Peter did that. And I wouldn't be surprised if Peter also shared a meal with them that, again, Peter would not have done under the Old Testament circumstances. A couple Bible passages here to point to that. So in Romans chapter 14, notice what it says. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. I hope that makes sense. I hope you can see how neither person is wrong. So I summarized it like this. When people eat or refuse to eat for the sake of their conscience, let us graciously accept their decision. So if we want to eat everything, people should accept that. If other people want to restrict themselves for the sake of conscience, we should let them do that. We should not be judging each other. And then one other passage here, Colossians 2, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink. So I hope that makes some sense. We'll get into it more in Bible class today. Getting to the final part here, we come to the heart-mouth relationship. Really, with all that I've shared so far, it's kind of important, but this is really the most important part, this third part. So Jesus is dealing with matters of the heart. Picking up in verse 20 of the text, it says, And Jesus was saying, That which proceeds out of the man, in other words, from his heart and through his mouth, that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, sexual immoralities, thefts, murders, adulteries, greediness, and wickedness, as well as fraud, lustful indulgence, evil seeing, evil speaking, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. What are we supposed to do with that statement from Jesus? Well, let's understand that all of us have a problem. What is the problem? Well, we have evil in each one of us. Within our hearts, we have evil. We have the old nature. Now, as Christians, we also have the new nature. Now, with the image there, it's kind of unusual, but let me explain it, though. So it takes me back to when I was a kid, and I always look forward to watching Saturday morning cartoons. Is anyone here with me on that? Okay, there are some others. Okay, Saturday morning cartoons. So once in a while, I can't tell you what cartoon it was now, but you'd have the cartoon character. Then over on the one shoulder, you have the little angel whispering in this ear. And over here, you'd have the little devil whispering in this ear. Isn't that a pretty good picture of the new nature and the old nature? So I guess it's become common. I've never seen a person with it, but looking at this image here, this woman with her right ear, she had a little devil actually tattooed inside of her ear. And then over on the left ear, she had a little angel tattooed into that ear. Now I'm not suggesting we get devil and angel tattoos, but at the same time though, it's good that we remember that as Christians, we have both the old nature and the new nature. Thinking about this a little bit, for people who are unbelievers, all they have is the old nature, and the old nature is controlling them, and we, we know that the old nature comes out of their mouth. What about us who have also the new nature? Now, we still have the old, but we also have the new. So what's important for us? It's so important that we are feeding the new nature, and the new nature eats the Word of God. 
So the more we can get into the Word of God, the more we are going to feed the new nature, the more we are going to strengthen the new nature, the more we're going to give the new nature the opportunity to dominate over the old nature, like to pin it to the ground so it can't uh, wreak havoc within our hearts and within our lives. What's going on with the old nature? We are supposed to drown it every day, but the problem is it keeps coming back to life and it keeps being a problem. So God is saying, stay in my word so that your new nature can dominate over the old. I want to share with you just two more things real quick. Here in Luke 6, 45, Jesus said, The good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth what is good, and the evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth what is evil. Notice the final phrase, For his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. So God wants us to have hearts that are pinning that old nature to the ground that are filled with the Word of God, with the truth of God, and may those kinds of things be overflowing out of our mouths. To be honest, are we going to have a little bit of a mix? We are, but my hope and prayer for myself and for all of you is that the new is way more than the old, is way dominating over the old. And then finally, a quote from Dr. Kretzmann. Notice what he wrote here. A Christian has need to watch over his heart unceasingly. In other words, we can never take a vacation and say, well, I'm doing pretty good as a Christian. I'll set aside the Bible. I'll skip going to church. Everything is going great. No, he's saying do this unceasingly, lest any of these evil seeds sprout and grow beyond all control. So, those evil seeds, that old nature, it's right there within us just waiting for the opportunity to be able to sprout and grow and grab a hold of us. So God is saying, be diligent in my word. Be diligent in keeping that old nature in check. We don't have to worry about it, but let's be in the word and know that God will work by the Spirit through the word to help us through to keep that old nature in check until finally through Christ we are with God forever. Let us pray. Dear Lord Jesus, you have warned us about our evil hearts and we thank you so much that you have finished your work in order to defeat sin, death, and the devil. Dear Holy Spirit, we pray that you would powerfully work through the Bible in each of our lives to keep delivering us from the evil one until finally we are with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for all eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.